It was still winter when we moved out of the city into our new house. And I remember how I used to stand staring out across the fields, waiting for spring to come. Tim used to tease me. He'd say, if it arrives while I'm at the office, be sure and phone me, darling. But actually, he was just as impatient for winter to end as I was. Because now, as soon as the snow melted, for the very first time, we were going to have a garden of our own. And what a garden. I could see it already in my mind's eye. Spirea? Cool white lilies? Tall tulips nodding in the sun. And iris that would outdo an orchid. Spring must have arrived while I stood there dreaming. All of a sudden, everywhere you looked, buds began to swell and burst open. Leaves unfolded and lay on their backs, looking up at the sky. Every wind carried the smell of damp earth and the wet bark of trees drenched by soft spring rain. Now came the moment we'd waited for so long. Out we went, gay as larks, wearing what the well-dressed gardener should wear, and trying not to look self-conscious in our new robe. Ah, what bright new tools, and what bright shining hopes we had. Brand new gloves over our tender city hands. The first trowel full of earth was like a ceremony, a solemn dedication. This was our earth, our very own, more wonderful than any other soil. Miraculous in the hand, our land. We really felt sorry for them. One look was all we needed to tell us that this charming young couple didn't know which end of a bulb was up. Thought we'd be good neighbors. Tell them what they're up against. Give them a little friendly advice. I broke the bad news gently. Folks, I said, you've got about the worst soil of anybody this side of the Mississippi. It's so full of clay, you could make bricks out of it. And I ought to know. I watched those bulldozers scrape it up when your house was built. Then I tried to explain why plants have such a hard time in clay or problem soil. If you could look below the surface, you'd see that the particles of clay lie overlapping each other. When water strikes them, the particles begin to absorb it as fast as they can. But the water expands them, makes them press more and more tightly together until the surface is sealed almost shut. The water has a hard time getting down, and the seedlings can't come up. When the water evaporates under the heat of the sun, the particles shrink back to their original size, and the shrinking causes cracks in the soil. Water is lost even more quickly, and the surface becomes caked and dry. If you cultivate soil like this, it doesn't solve the problem. Cultivation will break up any soil into tiny aggregates and make the soil fine and porous. But when the water strikes these clay aggregates, they disintegrate. They revert to their original structure, and the trouble begins all over again. So that's what your plants are up against, I told them, bad soil structure. Well, sir, the young lady got a funny little hurt look on her face. And her voice quavered. Thanks very much, she said, but, but I think it's just lovely soil. And off she went. What can you do? Some people have to find out the hard way. We were defiant now. 
We were going to show our good neighbors, the Harringtons, that our soil was as good as theirs any day. What if it was sort of sticky and hard to spade up? You can't have a garden without hard work. And Jim never let out a whimper. He was game right up to the last blister. Finally, the soil was ready. Carefully, oh so carefully, I laid out each row of the seed bed. Just the proper depth, the way the book said. I took a last look to make sure I hadn't made any mistakes. Then, the big moment. In went the seeds that were to become such beautiful flowers. Meanwhile, in spite of our nosy neighbors, Jim was having a wonderful time taking plants out of pots and putting them into the ground. He had never done anything like this before, and he was amazed to find out how good he was at it. went by. Never had there been such a perfect spring. Flowers by the million blooming everywhere, except in our own garden. Even our most promising plants had turned brown and sickly. Still, we did have one prize bloom, a lovely, lonely, brave little dahlia that we'd grown from seed. And as though nature resented even this small victory, up came a storm. That's when we found out that rain can be either a blessing or a catastrophe, depending on what your soil is like. For us, it was a catastrophe. When the storm finally stopped, we went out to see what the damage was. The rain had torn deep gashes in our soil. It had flooded the plants and stayed there in muddy puddles. We walked like a funeral procession through a swamp. Final blow was the dahlia. The storm didn't seem to have bothered Mrs. Harrington at all. She was out picking flowers. Imagine my consternation when I found out they were for me. I knew she meant well, but I didn't want her flowers. I wanted my own. After the ruinous rain, the earth slowly dried. It hardened and cracked. By now, we were completely disheartened. It was obvious that we just couldn't grow anything at all, while our neighbors could have beanstalks right up to heaven if they wanted. How did they do it? 
Well, why not ask them? So over we went to get the advice we should have taken in the first place. Well, up they came, sort of right around the ears, and told us their tale of woe. When they got all through, I said, well, folks, don't get discouraged. It takes a lot of things to make a garden grow, and one of the most important is the physical structure of the soil itself. Here's something you ought to try, a new chemical soil conditioner called Quillium, made by Monsanto. It'll really do a job on that miserable soil of yours. I wish we'd had it 10 years ago when we first started our garden. It would have saved us a lot of time and a lot of headaches. Let me show you how simply it works. You just sprinkle a little on the turned up earth and mix it in. Plants thrive in Quillium treated soil and I'll tell you why. When Quillium enters into clay soil, a very remarkable thing happens, because Quillium is made up of molecules that have a very special character. Each molecule of Quillium is electrically charged, and each molecule exerts a powerful attractive force. When the soil is cultivated, the Quillium molecules become mixed in with the soil aggregates, and they immediately go to work. Their electrical charges cause them to be attracted toward each soil aggregate, and they fasten themselves into the soil particles, entangle themselves, and bind the particles together. This action goes on all through the soil, and the small aggregates join together to make larger ones. Now, when water strikes the soil, instead of disintegrating, the Quillium-bound soil aggregates hold their structure. The water is able to penetrate the porous soil easily. Some of it is absorbed and held by the aggregates. The rest moves down to the subsoil level, as it should. Held in this way by the aggregates, the water is evenly distributed and available for plant use. Because the Quillium treated aggregates lie loosely against each other instead of caking together, fresh air can move down between them, furnishing oxygen, and the carbon dioxide has a chance to escape. The soil is able to breathe. I took a handful of Quillium treated earth from my flower bed and I told the young lady to pick up a handful from her side of the fence. Now watch what happens when we water these two samples, I said. The Quillium treated soil stays crumbly and porous. Even when I squeeze it, the aggregates don't disintegrate. Your soil turns to sticky clay mud. <laughs> no wonder your plants couldn't grow in it. It wasn't too late to start all over again, and this time we were going to do it right. We got the Krillium and read the instructions that come inside the container. We waited until the soil was neither too wet nor too dry, and then we laid out our flower bed and spaded the earth to a depth of about six inches. Mr. Harrington told us that would give us plenty of room for root development.
we sprinkled on the Krillian. Not much, just dusting it on evenly and lightly, using the proper amount for the size of the seed bed. Next step, we turn the Krillium under, mixing it well down into the soil. Mr. Harrington was careful to explain that Krillium is not a fertilizer, it's purely a soil conditioner. You have to put in whatever else your soil needs in the way of enrichment. So after we had added the fertilizer, we find the earth, breaking it up well, and raked it down smooth, so that the little seedlings wouldn't have to knock their tender heads against any big clods on the way up to the surface. And now it was ready for planting. I put in lilies, because after all our disappointments, I really did want something proud and spectacular to make up for it. And we just got in under the wire with some hardy late annuals. We'd have a lot to show before frost. We water the seed bed lightly to start the Krillium working. After a few hours, we'd water it thoroughly again. Jim made a little experiment. He turned the hose on the untreated soil, and it slaked right down into mud. Now that I knew a little bit about it, I was appalled to think how many beautiful flowers we had condemned to death in that clayey soil before we knew about Krillium. The treated soil stayed crumbly and porous, and we knew it was that way right down to the bottom of the bed. When fall came, the kids were ready for a front lawn. They sure needed one. They'd never put in a lawn before, and they had some misgivings. They had a problem, all right. It was quite a slope, and erosion had already gotten a bad start in some spots. If they had let it go, their topsoil would have gradually run right off down the street. Here was a job for Quilliam to help with. It was too big a stretch to work by hand, so I advised them to use a rotary tiller. The soil was stony and hard packed, but it wasn't long before they had it broken up well. After they'd raked the area smooth, I told them to broadcast their seed. And I showed them how to cross-sow the seed, so they could be sure it was evenly distributed. They smoothed out the overseeded spots, firmed down the seeds with an empty water roller. And on top of it all, I told them to apply their Quillium. This surface application is wonderful for lawns, particularly for slopes where there's danger of topsoil washing away. When Quillium is sprinkled and left on the surface this way, it forms a film which doesn't prevent the absorption of water but ties the surface particles of soil together so that the rain will not carry them off. After the Krillium has been sprayed over the seeded lawn, you spray it lightly, just enough to wet the surface. This activates the Krillium. to worry about your lawn getting washed out before it germinates. You're all set. 
Mr. Harrington showed us another way to use Krillium, for planting shrubs and such. First, have your husband dig a fine, deep hole. The exercise will keep him in good condition along with the soil. Check moisture content of soil. See instructions. Mix proper amount of Krillium into soil. Knead well. Put about three inches of treated soil into the hole first, then set your shrub down on top of it. Fill part way with treated soil. Trample down so there are no air pockets. Now, female ingenuity needed for this. Turn on hose and water lightly to activate the Krillium molecules. Have husband put in more soil. Sprinkle lightly, and remember to let the Krillium work for eight hours before you water again thoroughly. Then, call neighbors to admire. We tried Krillium with soil for our window boxes, too. The directions are on the container, you can't go wrong. Just mix it into the earth well. Put in your seeds. Sprinkle. And put the box in the window. You know what? We have a lawn. You know what? We have flowers in our window box. And slowly but surely, the garden I dreamed of has become a reality. The hard, disheartening earth that resisted all our efforts has become friendly, workable soil, yielding new miracles with every changing season. After year, our garden grows more beautiful. And every year, I observe a very personal anniversary. On this day, I pick an extra lavish bouquet and give it to my neighbor, both in thanks and in memory of a certain bouquet she once gave me, before I was garden-wise. <laughs>